I'm a firm believer that social democracy is still the right political framework for the future, but it needs to renew itself. It needs to have a clear narrative about the future. It needs to show people that it, it can reform the state and government effectively in order to help people through what is going to be a vast world of change. And it, it's got to position itself, in my view, on the centre-left, progressive side of politics and not um, on the more far left. If it does those things, it can, it can renew itself for sure. And if you look around um, the Western world today, I think it's perfectly obvious that that space that is there can be occupied either by new political parties that arise, centrist type of political parties that arise, or it can, it can be occupied by a renewed social democracy. Where do you think that means positioning social democracy on issues like immigration, the, the, the sort of culture wars type issue? Yeah, if you don't deal with the cultural challenge, you just, you, you're not at the races. You're, you're going to hit a ceiling of, of votes. And so for social democrats, you've got to understand there's genuine concern about immigration. You have to deal with the, the genuine concern in order to be able to make the case as to why immigration is basically a good thing, not a bad thing. But you've got to distinguish always between the groups of people who are anti-immigrant, that you don't really want to appeal to, frankly, and the groups of people who aren't anti-immigrant, they just think the system is not without proper controls. They think it's important that when immigrants come to a country that they subscribe to its values and that they integrate as well as keep their own space for diversity. If you don't deal with that issue, you're not dealing with a big concern. And that's what European social democratic parties and to a degree conservative parties, traditional conservative parties have learned in Europe over the last few years, which is why the issues underlying Brexit, as I've always said, are not specifically British. Did you, or do you, would you accept now that Blair Brown years took their eye off the ball on immigration, that you didn't see the effect particularly, for example, of East Europeans coming in in those numbers and, and how it would change the political dynamic? Right, one of the extraordinary things when you leave power is you, you realize that people, for various political reasons, can literally rewrite the history of your government. When we first came to power in 1997, we took tough measures on asylum to control the numbers. We actually fought the 2005 election around immigration because the Conservatives were campaigning on it. We had a program for identity cards, if you remember, which was hugely controversial, but was there so that we could tell who could come into the country and who not. We did masses of things on immigration. I mean, this is a complete misreading of our government. Now, it's true in 2004, we didn't put in the transitional arrangements for work when these new countries joined the European Union. And you can debate whether that was right or wrong. And by the way, there's a lot to be said on both sides of the argument. But people forget freedom of movement came in immediately. The only thing that didn't come in was freedom to work immediately. But the, the evidence was absolutely clear at the time that people were going to come and the risk was that they would come and work illegally. Now, having said all of that, if I'd still been in office post 2007, I would have been picking up the concern around immigration, as indeed people have now today in Europe. And I would have been proposing a tightening of the system, frankly, in order to meet that public concern. Not because I'm anti-immigrant or I want to concede to prejudice, but because if there is a genuine concern, for example, with uh, immigrants coming in from Eastern Europe and undercutting wages, you, you've got to deal with it. So, no, we were... <laughs> I had my eye firmly on the immigration question all the time I was in government. It does seem to be an issue, though, that, that's very difficult for people on the left. I mean, you've got, for example, sure. Scandinavian parties on the left taking quite a tough stance and then if you talk to German Social Democrats, who obviously were very much behind Merkel on, on the refugee issue, they don't want to touch it. They just see it as tainted, don't they? Yeah, but th this is why you know, the left's got to always understand if you've got genuine concerns. It's the same with issues like law and order. You, know, you can have every liberal impulse you want and you should have. But in the end, if there is a genuine concern, you've got to deal with it. And there are genuine concerns about immigration concerns about particularly, frankly, and again, you've got to be honest about this in the left, if you want to deal with the problem. There's an anxiety about people coming in from Muslim countries as to whether they are truly going to integrate with society or whether you might have security or problems to do with, with um, extremism coming in on the back of it. If you, if you literally just say, well, I, 
it's too difficult. I don't want to have that conversation. Fine, but then you're not having the conversation that your people are having. So if you take working the class voters, you know, the types of people who voted Brexit, Labour, people who would be Labour on many, many issues, there is a real anxiety about immigration. You've got to deal with it. You can't just leave it to, to fester, because if it does fester, that's when they think you've given up on listening to them. And then they, you know, the Pied Pipers come along from the far right and lead them down a, a path where, you know, as we can see in Britain today, Brexit, which is the answer to literally nothing, becomes their idea of what is a solution. In terms of the, the, the uh, advance of, of the populist right across Europe, uh, there's a situation now where some people say they might even get to a third of, of seats in the European Parliament. How is that changing the atmosphere, do you think, politically? Well, I think there's a huge fragmentation going on. I think that the most difficult thing to work out is the degree to which these changes in politics, because the numbers of people voting for populist parties have trebled over the last couple of decades, the number of populist parties in government has risen enormously, even if they're not a majority in the government. The question is, and then there's a fragmentation to the centre as well. You've got centre parties also starting. The question is, the degree to which this is the product of mistakes by the traditional Conservative and, and Labour parties, if you like, which can get corrected over time, and the degree to which this is part of a broad social change that's going on in society. I think it's a mix of both. And I do think today you have different categories of people who don't fit the old political coalitions. Now, I still think social democracy can build a new coalition, which is basically of people who are socially liberal, uh, economically on the side of enterprise, but recognize the necessity of having a strong government and state to help people through a process of change. But, and I think that coalition is a majority coalition in any of our Western democracies, but it cuts across some of the traditional coalitions. You, you find some people who would have voted Conservative joining that coalition, and you would find some people who would traditionally say Labour who would fall out of it. Is Macron, in a sense, the hope of the centre-left, or is he part of that fragmentation in the centre and somebody who, in a sense, has, has got his own liberal political interest. Macron is part of the fragmentation, but he is also, I think, identifiably in, in the broad social democratic liberal tradition. And remember, you know, if you go back 100 years or more, that alliance between liberal elements and social democratic or democratic socialist elements was, it was always in and around politics. Um, and so I think in, in one way, Macron has a foot in either of those camps, and, and that's, that's fine. That's probably where the modern social democratic coalition is built. Although he, it seems, is going to align with the liberals in the European Parliament rather than the social democratic and socialist group. Uh, yeah. Look, I think group. in terms of his, where he stands in the European Parliament, I mean, I think you know, he, he will probably gravitate towards the Liberals, obviously. But, you know, the truth is he, he would be, he would, in, ter in new Labour terms, if you put it like that, he would fit in that tradition perfectly easily. Do you think um, parties, well, I guess wherever they are on, on the uh, centrist spectrum, should be willing to go into coalition with right-wing populists? Because Heller Tawning Schmidt says they should be. Well, you've got to make a judgment in each case on, on what the policy platform is that you would adopt. I mean, in, in political systems where you, you know, you're always going to get coalition governments, you've got to get the right coalition, and I think you should just keep an open mind about that, but it depends what you're being asked to, to trade in terms of policy in order to go into that coalition. I think there's only a pragmatic answer to that. I mean, if, for example, you know, go into coalition with a right-wing party means that you're going to be adopting policies that are completely contrary to your principles, then you shouldn't do it. If, on the other hand, by forming that coalition, you're keeping out a more destructive right-wing coalition, well, you might do. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't ever... Obviously, we were in the position where we never had to enter into a coalition with anyone, but I, I don't think you can make that decision sort of a priori, really. It depends on it's what the circumstances are. It's interesting, are. though, that you're, it is a purely pragmatic 
judgment from your point of view. It's not an ideologically unacceptable thing, as it seems to be, for example, for Angela Merkel. Well, it would be ideologically unacceptable if their price was, was to do something that was unacceptable. And it would be ideologically unacceptable if there were a perfectly good alternative. So for Angela Merkel, she's got the alternative of the Social Democrats. Well, of course, <laughs> she would prefer to do that than, than go into an alliance with Alternative for Deutschland. And probably Alternative for Deutschland are so far away from where any sort of centre ground could be that it would be an unacceptable partner. But I, I don't. I think in, in smaller countries like, like Denmark, where there's constant shifting coalitions, I don't think you can really say in no circumstances would I ever link with a party on the right if, if, if by doing so you were able to you know, get a government that was majority progressive. Um, we've talked about immigration, obviously. Uh, another issue that's come up with people we've, we've talked to about the, the problems that social democracy has now is, I suppose you could call it austerity, uh, broadly defined, the feeling in a number of European countries, including Germany, that uh, social democrat governments ended up undermining the social contract that they had helped to put into place originally in terms of benefits or support for people. Um, how difficult an issue is that, do you think? Can, can social democratic governments do austerity uh, and balancing the books and not be accused essentially of being class traitors or whatever, however you want to put it? You see, austerity is, is, is a policy that, you know, but when you unpack it, if you've got a, a severe public spending problem as a result of the financial crisis, all governments had public spending problems, you, you're obviously going to have to sort out your public finances, right? These things are always difficult. You usually pay a political price for doing it. On the other hand, austerity is a sort of badge of ideology is not sensible because you can actually then do damage to your economic growth by pursuing austerity in a way that, that, that undercuts the demand in the, the economy. But it's not the basic problem of social democracy. I mean, austerity and public spending issues you have to handle as best you, you, you can. The central problem of social democracy is that it's got to develop a narrative about the future. Now, my view is the single most important thing for all social democrats to realize is that we are living through and are going to live to an increasing degree through a technological revolution as far reaching in its consequences, further reaching possibly, as the industrial revolution of the 19th century. And when the full extent of the disruption of AI and big data, quantum computing comes through, people are going to realize that how you prepare a country for this is the central question of our times. You know, questions around, do you cut down public spending here or increase it there? These are important questions. But the fundamental question, for example, in healthcare, is how do you employ the technology that's developing in healthcare? The fundamental question around things like transport is, which is, could be subject to huge disruption through technologies, how do you implement it? Business, the digitalization of business, is going to be a massive problem. If you go to any business today, they'll describe to you exactly how big a challenge it's going to be. That's the thing that social democrats have got to have. They've got to have a, a narrative about the future, because they will always win when people feel that the future is going to be more secure and more prosperous for them if they have a government supporting them. That's what social democrats stand for in the end. They stand for collective power to assist the individual. But it's got to be directed to the modern world and not the world of the past. And it's got to be a notion, therefore, of government and the state that is empowering and not controlling, because that's the way people live their lives today. And the problem with social democracy today is very simple. It, it, it either looks as if it's supporting the status quo in an, era, in an era that demands change, or it's defaulting to an old left set of positions that are kind of you know, positions of the 1960s and 1970s and just aren't relevant to the way the world's changing. And they've got to get out of that, that choice, which is a choice either of being guardians of the status quo, which is what social democrats should never be, or frankly, just sort of political refugees from the students' unions of, of the past. This is, you know, that's why the Labour Party is in the position it's in today in Britain. I mean, it's, it's no mystery. <laughs> it's that the centre ground stopped being the place of change 
and the old left came in and captured the party. But the old left solutions aren't solutions and people want change. So that's where social democracy has got to be. If it gets there, by the way, it'll revive itself completely.